Hello to everyone in Gothenburg, a city that is wonderful any time of year. I'm very pleased to join you today. I'm Dr. Prag Khanna speaking to you from Singapore. Today we want to talk about the post-pandemic world, global trends and scenarios, and especially matters that are very relevant to you. Let me begin by taking a step back from the current pandemic and emphasizing trends that I believe began before the pandemic but will accelerate in their aftermath. Now, I think this is an interesting approach to take because we live in a time of great uncertainty, but actually there are things that we can be quite certain about. And the shape of the future of globalization is actually one of them. Now, this is also interesting because for many people, when we talk about globalization, there is a very binary set of views. Either globalization is going to collapse and retrench and nationalism and protectionism will win, or people believe that hyperconnectivity is the future, capital flows, technological connectivity, and so forth, without a lot of nuance in between. The scenario for the reality that does lie ahead, which is that in-between scenario, is what I call continental drift. What do I mean by continental drift? Well, even before the pandemic, the world was very noticeably regionalizing. The three columns you see here represent the trends underway in North America, in Europe, and in Asia. The three principal regional anchors of the world economy prior to the pandemic. And they have in their each, in, in each, in their own way, deepened and integrated further during and since the pandemic. Now, overall, this is also quite a different response from the way in which the global financial crisis was handled a dozen years ago. If you remember at the time, treasuries, central banks, international financial institutions came together rapidly to ensure that global supply chains and global trade remained open. Their purpose was to bring about a synchronized global economic recovery, and they did. What's happening today is quite different. There is much more an emphasis on the regional rather than the global. And again, that trend actually began before the pandemic. Let's look at North America. Of course, the Trump administration came into office on a protectionist wave in 2016. But despite that, trade with Mexico and trade with Canada increased, such that on the eve of the pandemic, the United States was trading more with Mexico and more with Canada each than the United States trades with China because of the tariffs on Chinese goods and the US-China trade war, but also rising trade with its two neighbors. Now you will remember that Donald Trump said, NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, was the worst deal ever. He called a lot of things the worst deal ever. But the interesting thing is that at the height of the pandemic, in the middle of 2020, what did he do? He signed the US-Mexico-Canada trade agreement, the USMCA, further deepening North American integration. Now, let's look at Europe. Of course, the common monetary policy and currency has been around for 20 years. But it took the crisis of the pandemic to create a very expansive common fiscal policy. Some call this a fiscal union through the back door. The first initial packet of the bailout, 750 billion euros, almost 400 billion euros as grants to the weaker Southern European countries, the ECB buying most of the new corporate bonds and debt. And now with the future budget of the EU, a lot more conditionality around harmonization of tax and subsidizing green industry and basically pushing for regionalization, nationalization even of supply chains. So all of this points to an EU that is coming out not stronger, but certainly resigning itself to the need for greater coordination than before. And then there's Asia. In the midst of the pandemic, actually, Asians also undertook a very significant integration measure. They signed the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, the largest free trade area 
or trade liberalization zone in the entire world. Now, this is interesting. We talked during the pandemic about the end of globalization, lockdowns, nationalism. But what actually happened at exactly that time? The three largest trade zones, the three largest geographic and economic clusters on earth decided to actually open up internally to each other better, to integrate more, to do more together, to coordinate more. And that was not coordinated. North Americans were not looking at what Europe was doing. Europeans were not looking at what Asians were doing. Asians were not looking at what Europeans and North Americans were doing. It was a human response in a time of crisis when global supply chains and networks and connectivity are cut off. We look to our neighbors. And so we acted, states acted the way humans, human beings act in times of crisis. We turn to our neighbors. And this will be a lasting consequence of the pandemic Does, and, and the trends that predate the pandemic. So even if the pandemic disappears, everyone is vaccinated, everything reopens, the truth is that people, economies will gravitate more and more towards the regional. There are many other reasons for that happening. Geopolitics is one. And of course, the rising US-China tension, uh, it goes back now almost a decade, for example. But there will be also significant elements of radical globalization. Just look at the digital connectivity. The fact that we can continue to have these conversations such as we're having right now, remotely, digitally, and people can all over the world. Much of the world economy didn't miss a beat. In fact, many people have probably shared with you that the, the implementation of digital connectivity and the utilization of digital platforms the scale of expansion and depth that was reached during the pandemic that would have taken five years or more to achieve without a pandemic. And that is radical globalization in many ways. I like to joke that I now, rather than choosing which country I will be in on any given day, I get to be in five countries on the same day. So we shouldn't underestimate that. Then, of course, there's capital markets, global foreign debt direct investment, portfolio investment. As China has opened its capital account, there has been an increase in capital flows in pension funds, uh, equity investors and so forth, investing in mainland China. What China is doing is actually what Japan and Korea and, uh, and other developed markets in Asia did before. And now China is doing it. So capital certainly remains global as well. Now, so there are aspects of localization, aspects of globalization. In between is this reality of regionalization, what I call continental drift. It, it portends a world of longitudes, right? A world in which we might think more in terms of north to south and a little bit less in terms of east to west or a balance between the two. And this actually is one of the original ideas of geopolitics. Actually, it's great to be speaking to you in Sweden because Rudolf Kellen was one of the founders, one of the original architects, one of the people who coined the term geopolitik in the 19th century. And he and his contemporaries spoke a lot about the need to have food production available during all four seasons in the same hemisphere. The only way to do that would be to think, again, vertically rather than horizontally. So at the time, what was known as continentalism was a dominant ideology in geopolitics. In North America, for example, it prompted the United States to purchase Alaska from Russia and to begin to move south southward with its more imperial policies. Of course, throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, it shaped European foreign policies and expansionism and so forth. But now, of course, it's more than just about food. It's not just about growing food in, uh, in a different latitude in the Southern Hemisphere, because, of course, we have global food supply chains and global energy supply chains. But it can also now, for the digital economy, be about digital labor arbitrage. I can hire a low-cost worker digitally 
who's roughly in my same time zone at a much lower price. And so now what we see happening is that with uh, outsourcing and you know, near shoring, somewhere in between is locating, allowing workers to be geographically free and flexible, but they, as well as the employers, most likely want to be in a similar time zone so that they can remain connected and lead a normal kind of schedule. So all of this, however, also has geopolitical consequences because what has maintained peace and stability over the last several decades since the collapse of the Soviet Union, which by the way was 30 years ago uh, this year, is also rising foreign investment. Now I talked about portfolio capital earlier, but FDI in terms of fixed capital investment in the factories and infrastructure of other countries. It is not trade that determines peace between countries because of course the US and China do still trade a lot with each other, but are rivals. The strongest indicator of peace between countries is the volume of foreign investment, fixed capital investment in the stock of assets in each other's countries. That, now if we do see a reduction of that in favor of the regional, that would mean that there would be um, you know, much less need for countries to depend on each other for their revenues, for their profits, and potentially that could weaken the fragile peace that exists today. That's something we have to think about in the world of geopolitics. Now, let's talk briefly about the different regions of the world and how this is playing out, and of course, come to Europe. Again, for Europe, for Asia, for America, trade and investment across these mega regions still matters greatly. So it's worth understanding what is happening as North America, especially after the, uh, the Trump administration and after COVID, continues on this path towards what I call the North American Union. Now, this is not a term that Americans will ever use. It's not a term that Canadians will use, but it is something that is gradually evolving. It will not be a supranational uh, organization like the European Union, but it will be something of a more uh, a tacit federation, if you will. Now, as I mentioned already, you can see this in the trade volumes. You can see it in the border crossings. Uh, many people would not be aware of this, given that the Trump administration focused on building a wall on the border to Mexico. But prior to the pandemic, and for a long time, these have been the two busiest borders on earth by far. There is not even a second place that I'm aware of. The two busiest borders on the planet are the US-Canada border and the US-Mexico border. And the complementarities demographically in the labor force and across industries and supply chains are very, very strong between them. And the reason I've shown you this map which is of course a topographical map. It shows you infrastructure, it also shows you geology, is to emphasize, of course, that these barriers are quite artificial. Increasingly in an age of climate change, we think in terms of watersheds, we think in terms of mountain ranges, we think in terms of river systems and uh, electricity grids and other ways in which we need to share resources to be able to preserve our ordinary way of life. And so I believe that despite the political tensions that we have seen dominating the headlines in recent years in North America, it is in many ways destined to become a more integrated continent. And as such, it cannot be counted out no matter who is president of the United States, because the population that we're looking at here in this peaceful, stable uh, mega continent is uh, growing to roughly 500, 600 million people. And so I think that this is the inevitable future of North America. Let's go across the Pacific Ocean to Asia, but also in the context of a global view. If you rank the economies of the world and visualize them in purchasing power parity terms, PPP, you will see that China is already the world's largest economy. And you'll see that India, which is only $3 trillion in US dollar in terms, but is about $9 trillion plus dollars in PPP terms, Asian economies are much larger than they appear. Now, it is important to measure them in PPP value because Asians mostly trade internally. They buy and sell goods made in Asia by Asians 
who are paid Asian wages. So there's no reason to measure their livelihood or their standard of living in US dollar terms. But you do also see that there is this tripolarity, North America, Europe, and Asia as the largest economic centers. Um, country regions such as the Gulf, where uh, your trade linkages, uh, exports are quite important, uh, is combines for about four trillion dollars uh, as well. So the GCC countries. So these, this is the world organized according to these GDP bubbles. But where will the growth be in the years ahead? We want to look to the future. Now, the pandemic has not changed this next point I want to make which is that Asia is not only the seat of the world population, right? Nearly 5 billion people also represents more than half the global GDP in PPP value, but is also the fastest growing region in the world. I call it ascending Asia. We look at Asia and we see, you know, mature or, or giant economic uh, zones or countries like Japan uh, or China. But Asia as a whole is much, much larger than that. And some of the regions that have young populations uh, like India, and Southeast Asia, and West Asia are also growing rather quickly. The further you look into the future, the further you see that the aggregate GDP value over the coming two to three decades is projected to be enormous growth, a, a tri tripling or quadrupling or quintupling of economic size in places like China and India and the ASEAN economies of Southeast Asia and a much more modest rate of growth in the traditional West, in the US and the European Union. So we have to look to Asia demographically and economically to find growth if you are in an export dependent uh, industry or even, as I'll mention briefly, uh, when you're thinking about portfolio investment as well. Within Asia, let me spotlight the fourth wave of growth. The first wave of Asian growth was Japan in the post-war decades. Then came the tiger economies, particularly of Southeast Asia, but also Korea and Taiwan. Then came uh, China, which is the third wave of Asian growth. And now, as I mentioned before, you have India and Southeast Asia as two very young regions that have been fast growing as well. So Southeast Asia is very interesting. This corner of the, of your, this is really the diametrical opposite corner of Eurasia from where you are right now. Now here on this map, in this rectangle, you have 700 million people, right? So the lar just about larger than the population of the European Union across a dozen countries. Each of them has a median age that is younger than China. Right? This is one of the youngest regions of the world. Only Thailand in the middle has a slightly uh, older population uh, in terms of median age. The GDP of this region, ASEAN, is larger than that of India with only half the people. Uh, just on the eve of the pandemic, this region was also drawing in almost the exact same amount of foreign investment as China itself. Even though its total econ economic size is smaller than China, and it's uh, poorer than China. Still, the amount of FDI coming in was so substantial. The GDP per capita is rising. The economies since the 1990s Asian financial crisis, and then came the SARS epidemic of 2003, then came the global financial crisis of 2008, and now uh, COVID. This region has been weathering those storms. It has learned to reform uh, much more rapidly. They've learned to open up more to foreign investment, to build higher currency reserves, to focus on export-oriented industries and build their trade surpluses, to control inflation. So this region is doing a lot of things right. Now that we are in another crisis, this is also a region that is putting the lessons to the test very quickly. You see a rapid response in issuing more public debt in local currency. They are investing much more in, or you know, fiscally being expansive and helping to support families and SMEs. So the economic recovery here will be very strong. And of course, they are further integrating, as I said at the beginning, through the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, bringing down barriers and establishing those complementarities so that 
they can also ride the geopolitical momentum and capture more of the investment that countries are afraid to put into China. The geopolitical coalitions that are forming right now are purposely looking at these countries to produce automobile parts, uh, pharmaceutical equipment, telecommunications equipment, and many other things, uh, so even semiconductors, so that there is a reduced dependence on Taiwan, for example. And in all of these other areas, a reduced dependence on China as a whole. So the geopolitical tailwinds are pointing to a large degree in this direction. Now, I mentioned the demographics, and I really do want to emphasize this point because it will circle back to solving the European demographic dilemma. The point here is to say that if I had to summarize the future of humanity in two words, the two words that I would choose would be Asian youth. Asian youth are literally the future of the human species. Already, it is one of the, perhaps the largest, most coherent group of individuals in the world. There are basically 2 billion young people in Asia. If you look at the bottom of this chart, the bottom chart here on the lower right, you see that just the number of working age millennials is 822 million people versus if you take the entire Eurozone, it's only 63 million people. Now, youth is much more than just working age millennials. It's all of Generation Z, or gener sorry, gener the millennials, Generation Z, and Generation Alpha. So overall, there's about 2 billion Asian youth. And within Asia, even though the youth population in China will decline over time, given the aging population and the one child policy, it will continue to rise in Southeast Asia and in West Asia. So demographically speaking, this is the place where you want to be doing business if you're looking abroad and you're looking for uh, consumer markets or geographies where infrastructure modernization is necessary and so forth, because this is where the young people are. Young people who are moving to cities, young people who are consumers, young people who are ambitious and want to travel and so forth. Now, let me emphasize this point, because if you want to understand the future globally, you have to look at the global demographic data. Now, I said that Asian youth represent you know, 2 billion people. Now, globally, the reason that Asian youth will be uh, a driver of global demographics into the future is because the world population has basically hit a plateau. In the next 10 to 12, maybe 15 years, we will reach what I call peak humanity. The maximum number of people that have ever lived will be alive at the same time. And that number will not be 15 billion people, right? That was the number that we thought it would be as recently as the 1990s. Instead, we're looking at more like 9 billion people. So we're almost there, actually. And something that's very interesting, but also very scary, even sad, is that the, today's children, today's toddlers, babies, Generation Z, were expected to be larger than, um, oh, sorry, are larger than the millennials. But Generation Alpha, who are today's babies, were supposed to be a larger generation than Generation Z, who are today's youth and teenagers. As you can see, over the past century, Every generation has been larger than the one before, but that is not going to happen. When we get together again, in maybe in the year 2026, but hopefully sooner, that is when we will know how many children were born up until the year 2025. And in all likelihood, Generation Alpha will wind up being smaller than Generation Z was. So today's Generation Z is the largest generation in the history of the human species, but it's also the last, and each generation may likely get smaller from here. Part of the reason is because we have had two successive baby busts. There was the baby bust of the financial crisis of 2008, fertility went down everywhere in the world. And now there's the COVID baby bust that you've probably been reading about. So in a very short span of time, Fertility everywhere in the world came down 
And therefore, with so far, few, so many fewer children being born, suddenly an entire global generation winds up being a lot smaller than we thought it was going to be. And that is part of why the world population is plateauing at this point in time. But youth, today's young people, those under the age of 40, I'm being generous with my definition of youth, um, still represent 60% of the world population. But instead of this youth generation getting older and being replaced by a larger group of children, they are not having children. And therefore, the present, today's present, today's living youth are the dominant generation of today and also of tomorrow. The present is the future. And this sounds like science fiction, but this is literally the world we are in right now. Now, why is it so important to explain this? Because we tend to think of economic growth that is generated and, and advanced through population growth, technological productivity, urbanization, and other factors is something of a given that every generation continues to improve in these respects. But now suddenly we're confronted with a finite world population. And therefore, it is almost zero sum. Where today's young people go actually determines the winners and the losers in terms of countries for the rest of this century, which is basically the rest of the time that we have in many ways, or at least the time horizon that we are concerned with right now. And that does, of course, bring us back to Europe the region with the lowest fertility next to Japan, uh, the region with a very high median age, similar to Japan, whose net population has declined despite inward immigration, despite all of the immigration of the 2010s, for example, where the working age population is already shrinking and where efforts to reverse the decline in fertility have not borne out. And on top of all of this, the region, your region, that has 50% of the world's outstanding pension obligations because of your generous welfare systems, which I applaud and appreciate and support, but only 7% of the population and a quarter of the GDP. This is your fiscal demographic dilemma in Europe. Who are you building your infrastructure for? Who are you developing your products and services for? Who? Are your future users, customers, clients, employees? That is a question that everyone has to answer. And only so much of it is going to be answered with robots and algorithms, right? And the truth is robots and algorithms may help you raise productivity and save on labor costs, but they aren't consumers who, um, who use your products and services and utilize your infrastructure and transportation and other um, uh, uh, devices and investments that you have made over generations. So we do have to look at the migration patterns of the world as they have been and as they will be, because you have to engage in that war for talent for young people in your geography or in the markets you operate in. So prior to the pandemic, migration had found a fairly steady pattern around the world. And actually, what many people are surprised that the largest stock of migrants within any region of the world is actually still the, the circulation of people in the former Soviet Union, crossing borders between Russia and Ukraine or Kazakhstan, Georgia, and so forth, right? Then you have the um, South Asian workers in uh, in uh, the West Asian Gulf countries. You have the Latin Americans in North America, Africans within Africa, Europeans within Europe, of course, uh, Arabs and Turks into Europe and so forth. So these are roughly that these have been the steady patterns, but what comes next might be different because we have these tremendous demographic imbalances between the aging societies with very few young people in the North and the teeming societies of young people in the South. And how will those be corrected over time is one of the central questions that I uh, you know, sort of spend my time thinking about. 
Now, this is a map generated by NASA. And what NASA is demonstrating or depicting here is what is called the suitability change. Green means places that are becoming more suitable for human habitation, and red means less suitable. So red does not mean that you cannot live there, but red means that it's becoming less and less suitable. So you can see continent by continent, region by region, what the anticipated change is. You can see things with great specificity. If you look at one of the arrows pointing from Africa to Europe, it goes right through southern Greece, where the wildfires have been breaking out. If you look at the red patch in the United States, you know that those are the drought regions, and they call it a mega drought. You know that, the, uh, that there is a significant environmental stress in the Amazon as well, of course, across the Sahara and the Sahel. And look at India, which is actually the most populous country in the world. Now, by the way, you know, China just had a revised census. They were off in their, uh, in their uh, reporting of the Chinese population by 126 million people. Oops. The Chinese population is actually 126 million people less than we thought it was. Right? That's what happens when you do a census every 10 years, right? So in India is larger than China demographically. And look at the color. Most of South Asia is becoming unlivable. You have typhoons in some places and you have drought in other places. The water table is falling. Of course, it's immensely poor. And yet at the moment, it's growing fast. The question is, where will the Indians go from India? One of the things that I'm looking at is the size of diasporas. The Chinese diaspora is the world's largest, 50 million people. But owing to the geopolitical tensions and the aging population and the economic opportunities in China, many Chinese are actually going back to China. But the Indian diaspora, which presently is about 20 million people, is actually going to expand as Indians and Pakistanis and Bangladeshis leave South Asia and spread out around the world. So I predict that in the coming 10 or 20 years, the Indian diaspora or the South Asian diaspora more broadly will be much larger than the, uh, than the Chinese diaspora. Now, actually, you can already see this in Sweden and in Denmark and in Norway, because in Scandinavia, you have uh, taken on quite a few South Asian uh, settlers and migrants over the last uh, decades. Whenever I'm in, uh, in uh, Stockholm or Copenhagen or Oslo, I, it's always very funny because I'm speaking in Hindi or Urdu to the taxi drivers. Uh, and my children also find it very strange because they think of Hindi and Urdu as languages that we speak either at home here in Singapore or when we're visiting India or visiting Pakistan or maybe Dubai. But it was quite a surprise to them when we every taxi we took in Stockholm a couple of years ago, we were actually speaking in Hindi with the drivers. So this is a sign of the times. One of the largest vectors of population shift may be Asians coming to Europe. When I was growing up as an Indian immigrant to America, I was referred to as an, as an Asian American. There are today 25 million Asian Americans. The vice president of the United States is an Asian American. But how many Asian Europeans are there? In England, there is a stock of South Asian migrants going back to the post-colonial period. But Britain is not in, the, in continental Europe. It's not in the EU anymore. In the European Union, there's only 4 million Asian Europeans. But think about how we have the Belt and Road Initiative, efforts at greater free trade with Asian economies, more efforts to recruit Asian students to uh, European universities, and a shortage of workers in everything from nursing to technology. So you will probably see in the next 5, 10, 15 years that the number of Asian Europeans, that by the way is my term, I made it up, it doesn't exist, but instead of it being just 4 million people, you could have 15, 20, 25 million Asian Europeans, people who have come from Asia and permanently settled in Europe. Today, of course, the populist politics doesn't suggest that that would happen. But when you look at the demographic and economic challenge that I indicated earlier,
it's certainly a plausible scenario that there will be more Asian Europeans than Asian Americans. I actually went to high school in Germany. So when I was living there in the 1990s, there were almost no Indians in a 300 kilometer radius of where I was. Today, I travel to Germany very regularly and I see Indians everywhere. So that's a sign of the times. Now let's get back to Europe and European investment and who are you building this current infrastructure for? Because Europe has led the world in infrastructure investment until the 1990s when Asia really took off. And Europe continues to invest properly and rightly, not only in domestic uh, infrastructure upgrades, but also cross-border. You can see that when you look at Europe's energy grid, for example. Here I've put oil and gas pipelines, but of course electricity grids and cables are also shared across Europe. One of the things that you know it's uh, uh, pointed out quite regularly is that when after the uh, Fukushima nuclear disaster in Japan, when Germany decided that it would phase out its nuclear power, of course, Germany did not cease to be nuclear powered because it's importing nuclear power from France. And so you have a shared infrastructure more and more. The Nord Stream pipeline, Nord Stream 2, are examples of this, of course. And those have significant geopolitical implications. Infrastructure itself is a form of authority. Infrastructure changes the way countries relate to each other. And even whether they can think of themselves as sovereign when there is a corporate sovereign sometimes that is linking them. And this is the new world of what I call connectography. Now, when it comes to the energy grid, that was the example I just gave you about electricity. It's geopolitical also because on the one hand, Europe is making very significant investments in renewable energy and will certainly continue to lead the world in emissions reduction and meeting emissions reduction targets, whether it's the Paris Agreement or the upcoming uh, COP26 uh, summit as well. But, and in doing so, it will reduce its dependence on oil and gas imports from Russia. With the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, what's interesting is that on the one hand, it makes Eastern European countries, such as Ukraine primarily, feel more insecure uh, because now they will not earn transit fees and because Russia does not need to keep that terrain peaceful in order for its oil to reach Europe. But if you actually look at the map of European pipeline networks, those are the present and those of the future. It is very plausible that there could be more reverse flows, Russian oil to Germany or Russian gas to Germany, and then build a, a reverse routes that bring it through Poland back to Ukraine. And indeed, part of the reason that the Biden administration uh, signed off on the completion of the pipeline during Angela Merkel's visit to Germany recently is because they made a commitment that they would invest more in those reverse flows. Now, that's not the only kind of infrastructure, of course. What matters as much or more to you is transportation. And in transportation networks as well, Europe is leading the way in things such as uh, undersea tunnels and new rail investments and so forth. Outside of China, Europe is still innovating in this way to really tie European populations together. Some cities are even talking about hyperloops, for example. And in general, the marketplace for shared services in, uh, in the transportation sector, the financial sector and otherwise are growing thanks to FinTech and many other areas. So the common European space is one where the infrastructure is still getting more and more connected. And therefore, even as sovereignty starts to, uh, you know, continues to diminish, that population pool that needs to grow and the catchment area for the services economy and the goods economy and infrastructure uh, can remain robust. But as I said before, it is that nexus of infrastructure and immigration, right? Who are you building your infrastructures for? For which sectors of the economy or which people or which residents of the present and the future? And those are questions that have to be answered when you're making your business plans and your economic models. Now, a couple of my maps have, uh, have shown you a view of the North. Let's look at the world literally from the perspective of the North Pole. Now, I think the Arctic economy 
is uh, very promising if, again, you know, accidental emergence in light of climate change and the melting of the uh, polar ice cap. And the new shipping routes that are opening up uh, promise uh, significantly reduced shipping times, for example, from the far east uh, of Asia through the northern route over uh, Russia and past Scandinavia down to Western Europe. So I think that this is going to be uh, you know, an, an interesting development geopolitically, commercially, in terms of supply chains and transit, and in terms of, of course, uh, geopolitics as well, as populations are likely to rise. Uh, I have been uh, going to northern port cities uh, for some time, even to uh, Kirkenes in northern Norway, and looking at the growth in the Arctic economy, if you will, in many countries, whether it is uh, natural resources or whether it is simply their role as trade corridors or uh, you know, real estate destinations. This is a very gradual process, but there's no question that it is underway, given the map that I showed you earlier about the ways in which uh, the suitability of geography is changing. So what are the future centers of our future world population of 8.5 and eventually just less than 9 billion people. And I have been on the search for what I call climate oases, the resilient zones, if you will, for uh, future populations. Now, there are already cities that are well established um, that are heavily populated, that are traditional centers. You can see in the North America map, I have uh, New York and Los Angeles as black dots. London is there as well. Uh, the Rhein-Ruhr-Gebiet of West Germany and so forth. But these patches are zones that overlap with the climate forecasts and also represent areas that are not necessarily heavily populated today. And of course, one can include all of Sweden in this but that could become more populated in the future. So the largest patch, for example, that corresponds to the previous map is the corridor of Western Central Russia, for example. Um, so geographically uh, livable, uh, you know, uh, abundant uh, natural resources, river systems, uh, agriculture, and so forth. And some of these geographies are quite you know, less known and less explored and certainly don't factor into our daily thinking like the Caucasus region, for example, or the northern parts of Thailand, and so on and so forth. So in my new book, Move, I have actually gone around the world and given a profile of each of these regions, demographically, economically, and also climatologically. Now, let's remember that no place is perfect. No place is an island. We have seen forest fires in Greenland and in Siberia. The uh, forest fires of Siberia have caused air pollution in the North Pole. We are in one interconnected ecosystem. But as human beings, we have an instinct that is known as fight or flight. And we are looking for relative stability, ecological, social, economic, political. Places that are simply better than where we were before. And that, in that sense, uh, some of these geographies, their politics will change, their immigration policies may change, uh, their, their, again, their suitability, their habitability, their popularity will change over time. And that's why I'm trying to make an analysis of potential future geographies of growth that you can think about in terms of the geography of uh, providing services, of investing infrastructure, um, and of investing in, in real estate and other uh, asset classes. So in short, that is a tour of the world, a tour of the past, present, and some scenarios for the future. And I look forward to continuing the conversation with you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that, Parag. That was truly inspiring and definitely thought provoking. And as always, when you listen to interesting speeches and interesting people, there are a number of questions going through your head and I know that that is what has happened with our audience too. So I would like to ask you a few questions that has popped up during the session. 
Uh, and starting then with the speed of change, we talked about how some trends have been accelerated during Corona and some have changed and so on. What do you think about the speed of change if and when we eventually come out of the pandemic? Will that slow down again or will the speed of change continue to increase? What's your best guess on that one? I'm fairly confident that the pace of change will remain at this elevated rate that it is right now. And the reason is because a number of reasons. One is the recomposition of our stock market indices in favor of technology companies that have amassed tremendous revenues during this pandemic. They've delivered the highest growth. They've become trillion dollar companies like Amazon and others, and they will continue to invest at a breakneck pace in completing their mission, right? They have a predetermined mission to build connectivity, to expand supply chains, and they have the capital to do so. So for them, the end of the pandemic is no reason to slow down. It's a reason to speed up. So technological connectivity, infrastructural connectivity, and all of those investments are certainly going to accelerate. And again, those enable our habits, our instincts to remain connected, to be connected, to do our work digitally. It doesn't mean that we will never travel again, of course. We'll see, see continuous innovations in areas like electric uh, aviation, right? Whether it's helicopters or small aircraft, for example. So finding sustainable ways to remain connected and, and uh, you know, and sort of, you know, digitize and so forth is going to remain a major focus. And therefore the, the climate pressure and the fiduciary pressure the regulatory pressure to innovate will also be an accelerant uh, for the overall rate of change in our societies. And I think that many other social policies will change. Again, immigration policy. We have made, you know, we meaning say Western societies, Western and European populations have been very, um, you know, uh, sort of, um, on the fence, conservative, cautious about immigration for a long time and remain that way. So that's nothing new. But the demographic crisis that we have been talking about for 10 years, 15 years, is about to actually become worse. And therefore, that will have a collision with populist politics. And so I do anticipate changes in immigration policy as well. So the war for talent, as I call it, will absolutely accelerate as well. I see. Thank you for that. And given your expertise and, and the projections you have been given for the future, if you were to translate that into some do's and don'ts for a company like Stena, what would those do's and don'ts be? Well, do remain global to the extent that it is, you know, serves your interests. You know, if you, when I look at multinational companies, so many of them have the largest share of their revenue coming from Asia, for example. Uh, that's not the case with you, but it's the case with many multinational companies. And so taking those uh, profits from abroad and investing in innovation is something that one must do to be competitive. Because in every market where you are present, you are seeing Asian competitors coming in. Asians dominate Asia, let's be clear. Chinese products, Japanese products. You know, Apple has like a 2% market share in China. The world's largest company has only 2% market share in China, right? But for other companies, Asian revenue is 30, 40, 50, 60% of global revenue. So find those geographies of growth and do invest in them and invest in growing in them. Because one of the things that Europeans have to remember is that your products, your services, your engineering, your competence, your regulations, your standards are the best. And I find that Europeans often lack that confidence, which is terrible. But in fact, when you think about uh, companies now like Klarna or Revolut, right? You know, some of your own homegrown champions that are actually focused on young consumers, on young financial behavior, uh, you are growing tremendously because you are exactly providing you know, what young people want around the world. And specifically those companies from Sweden or otherwise 
are performing extremely well as they grow and expand in Asia. So think not think globally, remain global, because there's enormous opportunities for your competitive advantages to shine in parts of the world that are still emerging or ascending. And then, of course, as I say, invest at home. Don't take for granted that your system is still the best. You know, Europeans have been a little bit behind in terms of electric cars, for example, behind the US and behind Asians that have heavily regulated faster, especially Japan and China, around the um, uh, around uh, low emissions electric vehicles, to take just one example. When it comes to artificial intelligence research, Asians are also very strong. So the competition is global and you have to continue to invest in innovation at home. One thing also is, again, uh, you know, branding Europe as the safest and best destination in the world for talent. And that is actually true. From the climate maps that I showed you, it's very clear that Russia and Northern Europe and Canada are going to be the most stable climatological geographies of the future. There's nothing you can do for or against it. It's a, obviously a lucky geography that you have. But you still have conversations in which people say, well, you know, the best and the brightest, you know, will inevitably wind up in America and so forth. But no, that's not true. Because as I mentioned earlier, the growing number of Asian Europeans suggests the top Asians are saying, maybe I won't go to America where it's very far away, where the tuition is very high, where there's anti-Asian sentiment, where there's a lot of you know, political polarization. Instead, I'll remain in, you know, closer to home. I'll go to Europe. European universities are changing their language of instruction to English, as of course many institutions in Sweden have done long before others in uh, the rest of Europe and are offering subsidies and so be aggressive in the war for talent is something that, of course, will benefit yourselves as a company and yourselves as countries. And building on that, uh, what would be your one advice to us when it comes to tapping on to the huge potential of Asian youth and winning the war for talent when, when looking for the Asian European coming? Uh, what would that be? What, could you give us one or maybe two uh, advices? Sure. Well, you know, Europe, European countries, uh, some of them have the blue card system, which is the alternative to the American green card. And some of those countries, in some of those countries, the number of applicants uh, is lower than the number of visas being offered, which I find really strange. That's obviously a branding problem. When you live in the finest region of the world, the most modern, safe, developed, uh, you know, stable uh, countries on the planet Earth, and not enough people want to come to you, you obviously have a branding issue, right? So uh, that's why I say, you know, be aggressive and, and, and reach out. I think part of it is, of course, you know, cultural, but there's also generational change. You know, younger Europeans are more open to immigration. They have grown up with it. They are definitely cautious rightly cautious about um, you know, immigration without common values, right? without assimilation. I'm a very strong advocate, not just of open borders for everyone. right? I would not suddenly say, let us bring 100,000 um, know, uh, 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 Afghans to, uh, to Sweden. You, know, you have a lot of experience in Sweden in the last uh, more than a decade uh, with Syrian populations and Iraqi populations and others. And it's a, it's a mixed picture. You need to have very, very strong assimilation policies. You have to be proud of your culture, proud of your heritage, proud of the rule of law, proud of secularism, proud of equal rights and, and civic rights and so forth, and never let anyone impinge on those, whether they are domestic or foreign. So you can be very, very strict culturally but it is very much in your interest demographically and economically uh, to, be, uh, to be absorbing those migrants. And invest, investment in the social assimilation of migrants, wherever they are from in the world, is an investment in your own economic future, even if it means that your culture also gets modified gradually over time. And I would say, again, you know, with my experience in Germany, there is a very rich conversation about what they call die Neuen Deutschen, right? The new Germans. 
And the new Germans used to mean just Turks, but now it's actually a shorthand for everyone. It means Vietnamese, it means Syrians, it means Iranians, it means Africans. There are almost 1 million Africans now in Germany. They have actually asked to have their own census because they would like to know how many they are and they don't know and nobody knows. But what I see in Germany, having you know grown up uh, in and out of there, is that the effort that Die Neue und Deutsche Deutschen are making to speak German is really amazing. You know, and, and linguistic assimilation, and you can look at the Dutch policy. The Dutch have a very strict language assimilation policy. There is no way you can maintain your status in the Netherlands or ever become a Dutch citizen unless you speak fluent Dutch. So investing the social resources or allowing the private market to thrive in assimilation policies and teaching people Swedish and English, for example, at the same time, is actually an economy unto itself. It builds ties and allegiance to Sweden, and it makes you a hub for the circulation of talented people. All of that can happen if we think beyond narrow confines of pro or anti-immigration. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. And thank you for a great sessions. We've learned a lot. I think this will trigger quite a few discussions uh, in our different business areas. Uh, so once again, thank you so much for joining us. And we look forward to reading your book. That will be super exciting. So bye for now. Bye bye. Thank you so much.